You know, the year was getting off to a good start. I did my top 20, I had my resolutions in place, and then Fantastic Four had to come back for reshoots. And my life gets complicated again. It's gonna be a busy year for me, and I'm not talking about with the channel. That workload alone was crazy enough. Turns out the company I work for is overseeing at least two different shows. It's gonna be just non-stop for me. How much time I'm actually able to devote to this channel is unknown at this point. And that scares me a little bit. But as I've stated multiple times, that's my income right there. This is the hobby on the side. And then as much as it, you know, it pains me to just belittle my channel to that, that's what it is. But the healing process begins now. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Film Feast. My name is Sam Donches, and I'm your host. And this is the Film Feast Ketchup Edition. And not just any Ketchup Edition, we're finally killing it with Ketchup Edition Extravaganza. In this episode, I will be catching up with most of the general film news stories that I've missed in the past couple of months. I am leaving out some smaller stories, but that's only because these are the subjects that I really want to talk about. 13 news stories, none of which include Marvel Studios or DCWB. Those two studios have just so much news coming out of them that they will be getting their own respective episodes. So now that we've got all those introductions out of the way, let me start speeding through these news stories as fast as I can. Matt Damon is coming back for the Bourne franchise. Basically, Universal Pictures is so intent on keeping the Bourne franchise going with as much momentum as possible that instead of doing another Jeremy Renner led picture, they have actually managed to pull Matt Damon back in. And if you've been following this story to any extent, you'd know that Matt Damon said, I will not come back unless Paul Greengrass directs again. And Paul Greengrass is coming back to direct the fifth born movie. <laughs> yes, it's very exciting. This will be Paul Greengrass's third born film after Supremacy and Ultimatum. I for one am ecstatic about this news. I love the Bourne trilogy for the most part. The action choreography in Supremacy and Ultimatum just dominated the 2000s. Am I upset that Jeremy Renner won't be coming back? Kims! Not really. I didn't think the Bourne legacy worked. Kims! At all. It was... Kims! An attempt to recreate what worked about the Bourne franchise, but in the end it just Kims! wasn't enough. It was and also Jeremy Renner Kim, give him to me now. You know, there's nothing more to be said. I'm just happy to see Matt Damon finally returning as Jason Bourne. The untitled next chapter in the Bourne franchise is slated to come out on July 29th, 2016. The next story is about a Marvel property, just not a Marvel Studios property. It's Deadpool. Yes, the Deadpool movie is finally happening. It's coming out from Fox Studios, who still owns that character. It will be starring Ryan Reynolds. It will be directed by Tim Miller, and it will be coming out on February 12th, 2016. When I heard about the Solo Gambit film, I thought, hey, a Deadpool movie is just now that more possible. Lauren Schuler Donner is in the process of making films like that happen, but the prospect of it actually happening seemed so far-fetched to me, especially with that property. But now it's very much so upon us. Deadpool is gonna start shooting in March. Not like shooting, but you know, like shooting. It's not even how cameras work anymore. The film will be shooting in Vancouver, Canada. I'm actually a little disappointed because there was talk of it shooting in New Orleans. Us Louisianians, we love having the big budget films coming down here. The big names attract really good press. But actually, it turns out this film won't have a ginormous budget. In contrast to a movie like X-Men Days of Future Past, it's gonna be fairly dwarfed. But Ryan Reynolds has talked about how that small budget is going to allow the film's producers to get a little closer to possibly pushing that R rating button. To me, that still just seems impossible. Does Fox want to make any money? Yes, of course they do. Is an R rating going to help them earn that money? No, it's going to limit the amount of money they earn. But even with that being said, the envelope in the past few years alone has been pushed so far in terms of what we can show and what is not being censored anymore. Movies and television shows alike are getting more and more violent every day. In my opinion, I think the biggest limitation the Deadpool movie is going to have on it is the language that can be used. So even if a PG-13 rating is the final decision, I wouldn't be too discouraged by that. This next story is a little hefty. It's a multi-parter, a lot of facets to it. So much has happened with this movie over the past couple of months. It's all about the Steve Jobs biopic. No, I'm not talking about the Jobs movie with 
Ashton Kutcher. This is the Aaron Sorkin pinned movie. Originally, David Fincher was attached to direct this movie for Sony Pictures, but he wanted $10 million, full creative control, and he said, Christian Bale must be my Steve Jobs. Sony Pictures politely said, we've given you full creative control before and you gave us a lot of pushback, you did a lot of things that we didn't agree with, so they got Danny Boyle to direct it. Danny Boyle really wanted Leonardo DiCaprio to play Steve Jobs, but Leo said, nah, this role's not for me, and they landed back on Christian Bale. Christian Bale was locked into the role, but apparently not locked enough because about a week and a half later, he decided after much deliberation that he was not right for the role. So they come to Michael Fassbender. Michael Fassbender is playing Steve Jobs. That's the final guy. They've got him shooting. Seth Rogen is playing his partner. There are pictures out there of it, and that's what's happening. Admittedly, I still don't know how to feel about this one. I like the prospect of Michael Fassbender reading from an Aaron Sorkin script, but then there's the fact that Sony actually dropped this movie. This is now a Universal Pictures project. It ultimately comes down to We'll have to see what happens. John Lasseter of Pixar has announced that Toy Story 4 is happening and it will be coming out in June of 2017, seven years after Toy Story 3. Maybe I'll feel different about this story after I see Inside Out or The Good Dinosaur, barring my feelings for those movies, of course. But for now, another Pixar sequel just seems like a mistake, especially a Toy Story sequel. In my opinion, the little Toy Story shorts were doing just fine. They gave us plenty of insight into what was happening with Woody and Buzz and the gang. Granted, in the back of my mind, I always knew that this was inevitable to a certain extent. Whether they make a Toy Story movie about a new group of toys or the old group of toys, it was gonna happen. This next story is a little one, but still very exciting. Phil Lord and Chris Miller are returning to not just produce, but also write the Lego Movie 2. I'm especially happy with this news because Lord and Miller imbued so much life into the first Lego Movie. It was one of my favorite films of 2014, and I'm just excited to see what they will be bringing back, even just from a writing standpoint with the sequel. This next story is basically an update. It's the finalized cast for Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. As it turns out, Jennifer Lawrence will not be in the film. It's a different Jennifer by the name of Jennifer Jason Lee. She is joined by the other two new cast members, Demion Bashir and Channing Tatum. That's right, Channing Tatum's gonna be in a Quentin Tarantino movie, so while you've got your panties in a bunch, you should just put them in your mouth and swallow them, because I've made so many arguments as to why Channing Tatum is a pretty darn good actor. And yeah, a movie like Jupiter Ascending doesn't help his case much, but you just gotta trust me when I say He's good. I remain as excited as ever for Quentin Tarantino's new film. It's shooting right now in some very snowy locales. More story details have been released. I will put a link in the D-Box for you guys to go read those. At the end of the day, this is an awesome ensemble cast. I think there's something for everybody here. The movie is slated to come out at the end of the year. Next, I'll be talking about Ghostbusters 3, a project that has found its way into many different hands over the last several years, almost over the last decade. But now it's found its way into the hands of Paul Feig. He is actually directing Ghostbusters 3, and he has decided that it will be an all-female principal cast. Paul Feig is best known for directing movies like Bridesmaids and The Heat. He also had a major hand in Freaks and Geeks. Very talented guy. He's brought on Katie Dippold, who wrote The Heat, to write this movie, and he's also selected his principal cast. Ghostbusters 3, or as it's now being called, the Ghostbusters reboot, will star Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, Leslie Jones, and Kate McKinnon. It's a reboot because it takes place before ghosts are a known thing in society. They're also tackling the subject matter very differently, and it's not just because it's an all-female cast. The way that they're going about the story details is different and interesting. A lot of people are gonna say that this goes into gimmick territory, but plain and simple, Paul Feig just likes working with hilarious women. This next story just makes me giddy to think about. There's an Uncharted movie in the works. It's passed from person to person. It was in the hands of David O. Russell for a while. As far as I know, there's no director announced for it currently, but it has found its way into the hands of screenwriter Mark Bull. Academy Award winning screenwriter Mark Bull. He wrote The Hurt Locker and he will be writing the Uncharted movie. That is cool. Amazon announced recently that they are going to start acquiring the rights to distribute some movies. 
This is very exciting because at this point it's like, why not? Their instant streaming service through their Prime network is extremely successful. It's one of the most su successful streaming networks after Netflix. They've produced original content of their own, so this just seems like the next obvious step. I think eventually this new Amazon Studios will get into the producing game. They're actually going to start making movies instead of just acquiring them. There are no current acquisitions in the pipeline, which seems extra odd to me because Sundance just happened, although this is a studio still just getting up on its feet and we will see what happens. Edgar Wright has a new film in the works. Of course he does. He's a creative genius. I knew it would be no time at all after the Ant-Man debacle that he would be churning something out. And now finally we're hearing a little bit about it. The film is currently being called Baby Driver. Edgar Wright has set his sights on the Fault in Our Stars actor Ansel Elgort to play the lead, and it's about a young man, a getaway driver, who relies on the beat of his own personal soundtrack to be the best in the game. As it turns out, Edgar Wright directed a music video several years ago that stays in line with this general plotline. It's very interesting to see how he plays it out in that short form, but I am very excited to see what he does with it in feature length. It's always cause for excitement when a new Edgar Wright movie is upon us, but especially with this kind of material. The getaway and the chase sequences, the art of that has always been so intriguing to me. And just imagining Edgar Wright doing that sort of thing, Edgar Wright taking on material like Drive and Fast and the Furious and Bullet, the Italian job, it just it's already very mesmerizing to me. Emma Watson herself confirmed that she will be playing Belle in Disney's upcoming live action adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. Whew, okay, let's start by saying I don't know why Disney is so intent on these live action reimaginings of their classics. It started with Maleficent last year, it's going on to Cinderella this year, and eventually we're gonna have a Beauty and the Beast remake. I like Emma Watson, she's very talented, very passionate about this role, but at the same time I don't understand Disney's thinking with remaking all of these movies in live action form. Maleficent made a lot of money, and Cinderella's probably gonna make a lot of money as well, especially because it's got a Frozen short in front of it, and I can imagine Beauty and the Beast making making money as well, so this isn't gonna end. Oh god, I really don't want to see what the live action Little Mermaid's gonna look like. The casting process for X-Men Apocalypse is well underway. Oscar Isaac, who will be in Star Wars The Force Awakens, has been cast as the titular villain in this next X-Men film. Audiences got their first look at Apocalypse in the end credits sting for X-Men Days of Future Past. We see him in Egypt, building the pyramids with his brain and that's kind of crazy. Unfortunately, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart will probably not be returning to their roles for X-Men Apocalypse, although we will see James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender return. Also returning from X-Men First Class is Rose Byrne's character, Moira McTaggart. I didn't think that Rose Byrne would be returning for any of these movies after First Class because her character's mind was wiped at the end of that film, so it'll be interesting to see what capacity she returns in for this movie. We will also be introduced to a young Storm, Cyclops, and Jean Grey. Alexandra Ship will portray a young Storm, Ty Sheridan will be Cyclops, and Sophie Turner will be playing a young Jean Grey. And now for the final story. Thank you guys so much if you sat around and watched this whole video. Did you like Neighbors from 2014? Good because it's gonna have a sequel. Seth Rogen and Zac Efron are returning for the sequel, and speaking of Rose Byrne, she's also returning. Neighbors 2 is slated for a May 13th, 2016 release. No brainer as to why they're making a sequel. The first one made a ton of money at the box office. I definitely enjoyed it, more than the interview even. So yeah, that's it, at least for general news. I still have to talk about Marvel Studios and DCWB, and I have to do a TV dinner where I catch up on TV news. And I can only assume while I'm editing this episode that even more news stories are gonna come out that I'm gonna have to do another catch up edition episode about. Oh God. But before I let you go, there's a few quick announcements that I'd like to make. Follow the Film Feast on Facebook because I am posting all of my movie reviews there. They may not be video reviews, but they're quick little paragraphs showing my general thoughts on a movie. It's very easy to read and while I don't have time to do video reviews, that's gonna have to do. Also, I have a new Twitter handle. I am now at The Film Feast. So much easier. All right, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Sam, this is The Film Feast. Don't forget to stay tuned to this YouTube channel for more. Subscribe, like this video, comment. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for watching. 
Much like Jurassic World, the trailer that I will be talking about in this episode is related to a franchise that really defined my childhood and also really built the way I see movies nowadays. Obviously, I'm talking about the trailer for Star Wars The Force Awakens. And you should totally check it out, it's a really good movie. Especially if you like revenge movies, and I'm not talking about badass revenge movies like the ones that Quentin Tarantino makes. I'm talking about really dark, gritty movies.